Jessie channel. Welcome back to another video. I'm Jessie and you're watching. Welcome to my August and September wrap up. In the month of August, I read eight books. I read eight books, which is decent. I like to read 10 books a month. And that, let's be honest, I have not read 10 books a month at all this year. The first book that I read in the month of August was Lakewood by Megan Giddings. I can't remember if it's Giddings or Giddens. I think it's Giddings. It's Giddings, right? I listened to this book via audio and it was, it was so good that I immediately ran out to get the physical copy. It, oh my gosh. In this story, we are following a young woman who is reeling from the loss of her grandmother and she, she not only is having to deal with the loss of a woman that meant everything to her, but she also learns that she has inherited a lot of financial debt as a result of the death of her grandmother. She's young, she's naive, and she's desperate for money, and she signs up for this incredibly sketchy governmental experimental... Governmental experimental. That's... Okay. Experimental government program. Now, as she enters this program, she is given a front. She's given a story that she has to tell literally everyone in her life in order to keep them from learning any details about the organization that she is working with or working for, I should say. And the money is just more money than her family has seen in a lifetime combined. They pay her well enough to stay quiet. And so she's comfortable with this at first, but as the story unwinds, the experiments get more and more dangerous, the stakes get higher and higher, and she begins to genuinely fear for her life. That is all I'm going to say in terms of the synopsis. I'm going to, I think that this is one of those books that going into with little information will give a bigger payoff for the reader. I gave this book five out of five stars happily. The writing was amazing. The suspense and the horror, the horror was phenomenal. Um, the social commentary on capitalism, mental illness, racism, class issues were just phenomenal. So much about this book was subversive, but the book knew when to be subversive and subtle and when to punch you in the face. And if you are one of those people that gets really, really got by body horror, like I am, body horror hits me heavy for personal reasons, okay? And there's so much body horror in this book. If things like people's teeth falling out or medication causing bodily transformations, that sort of thing freaks you out, this you might want to take care with this book but because those are things that really scare me I was highly excited by finding these elements in a black horror book and I thought they were phenomenally executed the horror was visceral and real I felt like what was happening to our protagonist was happening to me it just it was it was so freaking good it's also a little bit of an epistolary at parts which I enjoyed I just thought the storytelling was phenomenal my only critique for this book is going to be for the ending the ending I, I need to read the ending again because I'm sure I missed something. I, I I must have. I clearly must have missed something because I feel like I turned the page and then the book just ended. Like it just ended as if the author literally was like, oh shoot, my deadline is right around the corner and hit send. I, it, it just felt, I was, I was perplexed. Um, but the rest of the story was so strong and so powerful and had so many important themes um, and messages for broader society that I just still gave it five out of five stars, you know. The ending didn't interfere with my enjoyment of the book itself, which is why I still gave it five out of five stars. Now I am going to say, I am going to say that um, this book has been done quite dirty by non-black reviewers. And what I mean by that is there are a lot of people um, who aren't black who are reviewing this book, reviewing the horror in this book, and are saying that this book doesn't count as horror. And they're also saying that this book is unrealistic. Now, I just filmed a video talking about uh, why we need to stop invalidating the horror and thriller books that people of color are writing. I it talks a lot about the racist ways in which white reviewers approach black indigenous people of color horror thriller books. So if you're interested in that, I will leave that down below. Um, that discussion is very, very, very much connected to my I issues with how people have been reviewing this book. So I'm not gonna go back into it because I just filmed that discussion. It's down below if you wanna see it. But I will say one thing I didn't cover in that video that I really, I really wanna make sure I cover in this one. There is a long, 
long, well-documented history of forced and coerced medical experimentation on black bodies in America that started with slavery. Okay, black people have been experimented upon in the United States of America since we got brought here. Okay, this is something that you can you can look up yourself. Like don't don't take my advice for it. This is well documented in history. It has been documented at length and also this continues to this day. So to say that the forced experimentation and the coerced experimentation in this book makes it realistic is mad racist. It's mad racist, it's mad ignorant, and it's simply not okay. It's not okay because it ignores the history of what black folks have had to go through. And it's also not okay because this is something that we still go through. Black people are still routinely forced, um, coerced into signing up for dangerous medical experimental procedures for multiple reasons. Now, there's a book- There are several books on this. The Immortal Cells of Henrietta Lacks would be a great, place to start. You can also start by reading up on the Tuskegee syphilis experiments. It just disgusts me to even talk about it. Where black people were injected with syphilis just to see how it affected the body. Didn't tell black folks that they were being injected with an STD. And I can't explain the catastrophic effects that this had on the black community. I do not want to hear one more motherfucking person say that the ending of the book and that the forced experimentation is unrealistic. <sighs> Tap dancing on my last nerve. Then I read Red, White and World Blue by Casey McQuiston and I was really excited about this because it's such a polarizing book. This is a romance, it is an adult contemporary romance between the monarch of the United Kingdom or rather the prince of the United Kingdom and the son of the president of the United States. I thought it was dope to see a woman president. I loved that the son of the president, Alex, was bisexual and his bisexuality was explored in the book. He's also white and Mexican. Although I personally, as somebody who is also Mexican, was not, I, I did not feel comfortable with the Mexican representation. And I know other Chicanx, Hispanic, Mexican individuals also were uncomfortable with it. I wasn't so uncomfortable with how it was handled that I rated the book down because of it, but I did side eye the representation a lot. It didn't feel authentic to me. It felt like um, we were just peppering in Spanish words here and there. Literally the only time Alex's identity, his racial identity was brought up was to make a point about racism. And I just hate to say it, but being a person of color is not only about enduring racism. I, 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 mm -mm. I will say that this book cracked me up. I was rolling, I was dying, okay? It was serving me life. It was ridiculous. The humor, the jokes, the banter, the hate to love relationship uh, between the two young men. I thought that was all really great. It was enjoyable. I love that the book also talked about some really important issues that explored politics at length and I do like political settings. I don't know why, but I very, very, very much do enjoy stories that surround politics, TV shows that surround politics. But overall, it was just a three star read for me. I will say that the romance did have its trials and tribulations. The, the couple was really tested. And I think that that is important because that's usually my critique with romances is that the couples just aren't tested to the level that I like to see my couples tested um, in order to kind of justify how deeply in love that they are. Even though I only gave it three stars, still a good rating, still enjoyed it. And I definitely am excited for Casey's next book, which I believe is going to be a sapphic female female romance. Now, a lot of you are gonna get mad at me for this one. Cinderella is dead. Um, I did not like this book, okay? I, I didn't. I actually read this for a failed Black Girl Magic vlog um, and the vlog just was a hot mess so I didn't end up releasing it because I can't put y'all through that. And a big part of the reason that the vlog was a mess was because I was so miserable reading this book. In this book, we are following 16 year old Sophia who lives in a kingdom that worships the fairy tale of Cinderella. Unfortunately, the worship for this tale has led to teen girls being forced to attend this ball in order to be accepted by a young man, or unfortunately in some cases, a, a, an adult man, and picked for marriage. Girls who are not picked for marriage are given one more chance at the ball, and if they are not selected at that point, they are pretty much cast out of society. In this story, this is a historical fantasy where women, girls just have very little rights. 
I'm sorry, what am I saying? They have no rights, okay? Um, it is a completely patriarchal society. Queerness is not acceptable. Any kind of defiance of hetero cis normativity is not acceptable. And our protagonist, Sophia, is queer. She likes girls. She's not interested in marrying a prince at all. And she has a very kind of under lock and key romance in this book with her best friend. But eventually Sophia decides enough is enough and ends up meeting one of the final descendants of Cinderella. She decides to stop at absolutely nothing to turn this kingdom on its head and to funk the patriarchy. Okay look here's my issue with the book. I love, you know that I love my social commentary in books. I, I really really do. Here's what I don't love. I don't love when social commentary is is I can't even say beaten over the head because that implies that there's breaks between beats. It was a constant avalanche of political messaging. It was so heavy handed. It was ridiculous. Every single man in the story was just evil, like just and, and 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 they were the kind of evil that was just so comically villainous like their wife would stumble while carrying a tray of tea and the guy would be like learn how to be graceful like a princess you wench it just just ridiculous commentary and just it was i'm just gonna read you some examples of what i'm talking about because I, i'm not articulating this well and that's why the vlog failed because i I didn't know how to talk about this book. Hurry up with that tea, woman, a gruff voice calls from the front room. I'm going out to the front garden to pull down the lines, my father says. That's woman's work, the other man says. How can I make you see that it's simply not worth it to defy me? You cannot win. He slips his hand under the girl's chin. Smile. You're so much prettier when you smile. Out of context, those quotes don't seem that overbearing, right? But I'm telling you, they're on every single page. Every time a man speaks, he says shit like this. And it's like, we, 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 get, we get the message you're trying to sell. Men are oppressive. But the reason that this bugged me the most wasn't because it was so repetitive um, and exhausting. It was actually because this is not necessarily how the patriarchy shows its face. This is not what it like what it looks like to be oppressed by men usually. Usually what it looks like is a lot more sneaky and insidious. It involves more gaslighting. It involves more psychological. Usually men who mistreat girls and women are far more sneaky and sly about how they go about it. And so I didn't the reason why I didn't like this book was because it kind of sells it pushes the idea that all sexist men are very visibly sexist and that's just simply not the case. I also really could not stand Sophia. Sophia was just an insufferable protagonist and I wouldn't have minded that she was so insufferable and that I didn't connect with her if I felt that she had grown and learned from her ignorance at all throughout the book. Um, for example, she's really, really hard on her love interest for wanting to stay in the closet. And she really does not respect that this girl doesn't feel safe being out. And she looks down on her and it really, really bothered me because that's problematic for so many reasons. Not everybody can be a revolutionary. Not everybody can just be out and proud. There are consequences for that. This girl's concerned about not only her safety, but the safety of her family, the security of her family. Nobody should feel lesser than if they're not willing to be out of the closet. That message I thought was really harmful and I just absolutely hated it. The world building and the magic in the book just really didn't do it for me, but it is a very kind of whimsical magical story as opposed to kind of more carefully crafted world building so if you were in the mood for something kind of whimsical and magical cool go for it if i had to give this book a rating i would i would honestly give it like a a 2.25 stars which i okay we're just gonna move on. Next book that I read was Citizen. I read this as an audiobook. It was an hour long. If you have an hour, you gotta download it. You gotta listen to it. It was just, it was freaking amazing. This is a nonfiction book. It's sort of a vignette, a collection of snapshots from this black essayist life. She's basically chronicling the racist interactions and the microaggressions and the, the just ridiculous things that people have said to her throughout her lifetime and contextualizing them um, with these really poignant, well-written explanations. She talks a lot about racism and the way that the black female body is treated in America. I loved how she talked so much about Serena Williams. I will always 
be full of rage at how Serena Williams is consistently treated by the media. I will always be angry about that. I will always be angry at how disrespected she constantly is. And so I loved the chapters where our, our author talks about Serena Williams and, make, and makes connections to her own life because she is also a tennis player. It's just, it's a phenomenal book. It, is a phenomenal book and I wrote down so many incredible quotes. I'm gonna share a couple with you. Because white men can't police their imagination, black men are dying. And this quote hit me so heavy. Your friend refuses to carry what does not belong to her. And this was referring to a white friend who failed to involve herself when a clerk was being racist towards the author. And it made me think so much about white silence and white people, the white people who do choose to stay silent and ultimately be complicit instead of speaking up against racism when it happens, especially when it happens to the people that they know and love right in front of them. Five out of five stars. I also read Love From A to Z, which is very arguably my favorite YA romance of all time now. I really need to like make a list of these and, and do a, a little ranking. Let me know if you you would be interested in that video. But this, I was not expecting me to fall so head over heels for this book. I just saw the audiobook on script. I figured why not, let's give it a listen. And I, oh my gosh, I swear I read it in like two sittings. It was freaking phenomenal. This is a, beautiful, gorgeously constructed romance between two Muslim teens. They're both biracial and I'm trying to remember specifically what their mixes are. I don't want to speculate because I don't, I don't remember, but he is of Asian descent. The other individual, Zainab, is black and Caribbean and I think she might also be something else, I can't quite remember. But I really loved the exploration of biraciality alongside the exploration of both of these characters as Muslim identity. I thought that was really beautiful. The story didn't shy away from celebrating Muslim religion and practices. It didn't water, to my, to my knowledge, okay, and mind you, I'm not Muslim and I know I'm not an own voices reviewer on this topic, but to my knowledge, it didn't seem like the book was kind of watering itself down in order to make itself more palatable and easier for non-Muslim readers to swallow, which I really, really loved that. I loved the celebration of religion and culture in this book. I also loved that both of the voices of both characters, Zainab and Adam, were so distinct. Adam is diagnosed early on in the book with a degenerative condition. I loved that we had not only a romance that centered biracial Muslim teens, but also also a romance that included disability. When I tell you that this is one of the most carefully constructed and thoughtful and just measured romances I've ever read, I truly, truly mean that there's so much development and these kids go through a freaking lot in this book. I don't even know if I gave you an actual synopsis. I just, I love this book so much that I just want to word vomit about it. I'm not even gonna give a synopsis, just read the damn book. I also really connected with our protagonist because she goes through being targeted aggressively by a teacher, a teacher who is known for hate speech and I went through the same thing and it was so frustrating reading those scenes and seeing this young girl have to come to terms with how people look at her and are, the things they're comfortable saying to her face about her people, her religion, her identity. It just, it was so frustrating, but it was handled so incredibly well. It talks so much about xenophobia and anti-Muslim sentiments um, and explores that at length. It talks so much just about coming of age what it means to be a teenager who is developing into an adult and trying to figure out what the what the funk you want to do with your own life it was amazing it was so beautiful please 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 read this book i i'm gonna read it again i'll tell you that much this is going to be a comfort read definitely one of my definitely one of my favorites from the year so far five out of five stars it was that was 10 star okay I'm a booktuber, not a mathematician, okay? Just leave me alone. I also read Luster by Raven Leilani, and this book has been making the rounds over on Bookstagram, an adult contemporary adult literature novel. And this is a debut novel by a black author all about a young woman named Eddie. She is a hot mess. She, she a hot mess, okay? She is a struggling artist living in New York City, and through a very strange, disturbing series of events, she finds herself oddly entangled with this wealthy white family and becomes their live-in nanny. The story begins with Eddie meeting the husband of the family and he sits her down and is like, yo, I'm into you. My wife and I have an open marriage. How do you feel about that? And Eddie's like, this sounds like a lot of drama. You sound like a lot of drama. And there is absolutely nothing wrong with having an open marriage. I, I totally support people who have open marriages, but the way that this man is going about it, 
it ain't it, it ain't it. It's clear early on that there is tension, but you know, she thinks this guy is just gonna be a hot sugar daddy. And when she moves in with this family, finds that she's getting a lot more than she bargained for. Now, I wanna say that this is some of the best writing I have read all year. I can hardly believe that this is a debut novel. It is, who, if you love carefully constructed, carefully crafted sentences that just sing Mm, th mm, mm. This book was a hot meal, okay? It was breakfast, lunch, and dinner, okay? It was the appetizer and the dessert. It was so good. It was so good. The author has an incredible ability of writing a single sentence that explains an entire character. They will, she will write one sentence that will allow you as the reader to know exactly who that character is. She is so amazing at summarizing characters. This is a carefully constructed character study. It is definitely not a plot driven novel. There's not a whole lot that happens. I will also say that if you're going into this expecting a lot of salacious, sexy scenes, as you are right to expect from the introduction of the book, the introduction of the book is is pretty filthy. It promises that it's gonna get naughty and the naughtiness drops off quite quite quickly. It ends up just being more so uh, a character study of this young, I believe she's 25 year old woman, young black woman in New York City who is a hot mess. She reminds me so much of Queenie and I love my just off-center, struggling, messy, don't know what the heck they're doing with their lives, young black characters. I absolutely love those characters. Those characters get sex shamed a lot. They get criticized a whole lot in the book community. And for me, those are the characters that speak to my soul. They speak to the parts of me that are broken and messy and hard to look at. And I really, really connected with Eddie and how messed up and just freaking off she is. I loved this book. Five out of five stars. I'm in the middle of organizing my book room. So I don't know where all my books are. And I read Nani volume one. Whew. This comic was amazing. I will leave the video linked down below in which I review at length. They were so freaking good. But I will say if you are looking for a fantasy story in which two girls are both martial artists, two sisters who love each other deeply are accidentally transported into West African civilization in which gods and other deities walk the earth, then you have to read this book. It is full of action. It is full of black girl magic. It is just so amazing. I, oh, the character development, the, the messages, the themes of the book, there were so many themes about toxic masculinity, um, about the value of young black boys, about female empowerment, about girlhood. It just, it was a great freaking comic. It made me so happy. It was definitely feel good. I loved the colors and the costumes. I loved seeing uh, black characters being painted in these beautiful blues and like rich neons and just rich purples and reds. And it, it was so gorgeous. And I loved all of the mythology in the book. <sighs> Great comics. And the last book that I read for the month of August was Let Me Hear a Rhyme by Tiffany D. Jackson. I read Let Me Hear a Rhyme as well as Luster. Um, on audiobook. I had a really on audiobook, wow, in audiobook form. I had such a great month um, in August for reading audiobooks, which I just, they, they swell my soul. They swell my soul and my soul is, it's, it's not very, it's not very big, so. I have read every book by Tiffany D. Jackson except for Allegedly and her newest book, Grown. And I'm telling you, every book that she comes out with, it doesn't disappoint. It does not disappoint me. I, oh my God, I just, I love her work. She is another fantastic black thriller author. And I'm gonna say that again, slowly, black thriller author. Um, I am really tired of people saying that her books aren't thrillers. Mysteries count as thrillers. Um, suspense stories count as thrillers, right? She writes mysteries that surround black youth. And Let Me Hear a Rhyme is one of those freaking mysteries, whether you like it or not, okay? And if you are confused, watch the video where I talk about BIPOC thrillers. Just, just watch it. This is a young adult historical fiction novel that is set in the 90s. Oh, and, and she did such an amazing freaking job of setting up the 90s and the vibes. It's set in 90s New York City, hmm, which is which is where I grew up. So I'm very freaking happy about that. But basically what happens in this book is these kids, these teenagers, these black teens lose their best friend. Their best friend is murdered and the police are really not interested in figuring out who killed this kid. And their friend was an incredible MC, just this amazing rapper, was doing his thing, was about to blow up, and they decide that they're not only going to find his killer, but they're going to pretend 
that he's still alive and release an album as if he's still alive. And I don't want to say too much about it because it's just, it's more fun if you go into it knowing as little as possible. It was phenomenal. Again, just, I, I don't even know what I'm supposed to say. I'm supposed to tell you that the writing was great and the characters were well built, that it knew when to hit you emotionally and when to pull back, that the suspense, the mystery was great, that there was lots of action in the book. I'm supposed to tell you all those things, right? But if you know Tiffany D. Jackson's writing, you just, you know to expect that already. So I, all, I, all I can say about this is that all of those elements were there. They were phenomenal. The book was great. Read it. Five out of five stars. Now we are on to the books that I read for the month of September. Let's just have a... I just... I'm a clown. I'm a clown. I am. I'm a clown. Remember in September when I uploaded this TBR and it had like 13 books on it? And I was like, yeah, you know, um, it's, it, I have a lot of books on this TBR, but th this is how I sound in my head. I have a lot of books on my TBR, but some of them are small. So like, I'll, I won't have any problem reading all these books in September. Okay. Do you remember that? Cause, cause I do, I remember, and I'm a clown because out of those 13 books, I read three of them. I read three of them. And then I read another book that wasn't on the TBR at all because of who I am as a person. The first book I'm gonna talk about is just a masterpiece of black girl magic, and that is A Song of Wraiths and Ruin. <laughs> I was anticipating this book like nobody's business. From the second the cover dropped, I was I was hooked. I didn't care what the book was about. I, I This is all I needed to know. This is all I needed to know. And good news, it's going to be adapted, and the cover for the second book dropped, and it's just, it's even more beautiful than this one. It's, in this YA historical fantasy, we are following two characters, Malik and Karina. Karina is the princess of a kingdom who every year puts on this big grand festival known as Sostagia. Um, Sostagia is also a huge competition in which the winner is granted a beautiful gift by the queen herself. Now Malik is from the lower class and when his sister is kidnapped by a malicious spirit who tells him that he has to kill Karina at all costs in order to get his sister back, Melissa, Ch Melissa, who is Melissa? Malik, Malik tricks his way, cheats his way into the Solstagia competition and he has to win at all costs. He has to win to get close to Princess Karina or else his sister is gonna die. Meanwhile, our Princess Karina has to hide the fact that her mother has passed away. Court is threatening to mutiny and she has to step up and take control of the court, which is plotting to unseat her in order to remain in power in her mother's kingdom, which she knows would have been her mother's last and final wish. So because she's not powerful enough to do this on her own, she starts seeking out some forbidden magic. Which always goes well. That, that, that never, that always ends well, right? Whew, this book was, it was, it was a lot. It was a lot in all the best ways. The world building for this book was phenomenal. It was incredible. The mythology and lore. I could not sing this book's praises higher. I thought that there were lines that absolutely sang. The writing was beautiful. The characters were unique. While I hated Karina, I hated her. I hated her. If she were on fire and I was holding a glass of water, I would drink it. I would drink it. Malik, on the other hand, is just a precious, intelligent, cunning, wonderful, just darling boy who should be protected at all costs. Okay, amazing. Um, I will say that there's awesome representation for migraines. Karina suffers from migraines as I did um, throughout my childhood. And I can, and I can, can tell you that mm, they are excruciating. And so it was really cool seeing that depicted in a YA fantasy. Malik also lives with pretty severe anxiety and I love the discussion about anxiety. I love that we got to see a young black boy with a mental illness trying to live with his mental illness. I thought that was beautiful. The storytelling techniques were really creative. There was so much stories within stories and mythology existed within the world as well as the magic for the world itself. I just really loved this book. Very excited for the sequel. I ended up giving this I think like four and a half stars. It would sitting somewhere between 4.25 and four and a half stars, just because it, I can't say, I can't talk about it too much, but it does get tropey. It does get predictable. It's uh, a little, a, a little ridiculous in some, in some places, but overall I thought this was an amazing, amazing book. 
And I read a classic, The House on Mungo Street. Um, I was really, really excited to read this. It's a short little book that my, my dog, my puppy, customized for me. So thanks, Akasha. Thank you. We're following a young girl who lives in a dilapidated house who is very poor and all she wants is a better life. And that's what she dreams about. She wants to be better. And so in this book, we're just getting little vignettes of her life, just snapshots of her hopes and dreams. And it is so poignant and powerful and beautiful. This classic is everything that I expected it to be and more. It's only like 87 pages, but there's so much to analyze and dissect in here. The writing was clear, but also poetic. It was so beautiful. It was truly, truly, truly a love letter to Latinx people. I felt very, very, very seen as a Chicana person reading this book. I loved it. I know I'm going to be reading it again. Five out of five stars. Next book that I read for the month of September was Ring Shout, another book I was highly anticipating by a novella author that I really love. This book is set during the Jim Crow era. It released on October 15th um, by Tor. And in this book, we are following a group of highly spirited black girls who are fighting monsters and these monsters are Ku Klux Klan members. One of the women fights with a blade, another fights by setting up bombs and another is a sharpshooter. So I love that we had this kind of like hyper talented team of black women who were getting together to assassinate a common enemy. And essentially some members of the clan are able to transform into these eight feet tall monstrous individuals who have mouths for eyes and just giant claws. Truly harrowing, truly horrific to be honest. Now, I absolutely love that this book was told in the oral tradition. Nothing makes me happier than seeing Black authors craft their stories entirely through Black colloquialisms, through AAVE, and through non-standard English. That's the way a lot of Black people tell stories. It is absolutely valid. They are powerful storytelling methods that have existed as long as Black people have existed. And I absolutely love whenever I see a story that is told in the oral tradition like this one. However, the oral tradition has to suck the reader in by weaving an atmosphere of consistent suspense and of enrapturement in order to be successful. And unfortunately, the handling of the oral tradition in this book just didn't hit for me. I wasn't immersed in the book because the storytelling wasn't gripping like it normally is. I kept putting it down even though it was super short and it would take me a while to pick it back up again because I just wasn't excited to read it. I wasn't like interested in the story when I wasn't actively reading it. It made it hard to enjoy a lot of the scenes in the book because the storytelling just didn't support what was happening for me personally. The things that I loved though, the horror noir is creating creative, disturbing, and unsettling. The premise of the book is brilliant. It's innovative and it's enrapturing. It's fantastic, but also fantastically rooted in reality. Another thing that I will say is that thematically, this book is also incredibly high achieving. There is so much to dissect and analyze regarding anti-Black racism, white supremacy, plantation life, and the various ways in which enslaved Africans and their descendants subversively and loudly resisted white rule. I also love that each and every chapter began with a notation centering myths and lore and legends created by African peoples. I thought that was brilliant. There's amazing celebration of Caribbean heritage in this book. I loved all of the black girl magic. Honestly, there's so much about this book that I really liked. But again, the storytelling just wasn't it for me. If I had to rate this book, I would probably just rate it three stars. And the final book, the book that I'm the most excited about, Save the Best for Last, that I read in September was to no one's surprise. The Dragon Republic, another book that my dog personally took the time out of her day to, to to customize for me because she hates me. So this, of course, is the sequel to The Poppy War. It's an adult fantasy in which we are following a young peasant girl named Rin who decides to go to the world's most prestigious, prestigious academy in order to become a soldier. And during her training as a soldier, gruesome and brutal war breaks out that she finds herself in the, in the center of. And then when you add in gods and their magic and Rin ends up binding with a god and getting magic from that god, she finds that having power only makes things more complicated. This has been called a villain origin story. It's essentially a story that, that explores power and war and the consequences of having power or not having power and the consequences of war on peoples. It is based off of the Sino-Japanese War. It is based off of The Rape of Nan King, which is a book that I read in high school. And I didn't read it for high school. I read it because my, history, my high school history teacher, who I absolutely loved and adored, mentioned that book. And he said that it was so horrible. Um, in terms of like 
the atrocities committed that he wasn't able to finish it. And I ended up going out and, and getting the nonfiction book and reading it. And if you're able to handle the subject matter, I think it's really important to read that book in order to get the context that you need in order to truly understand the Poppy War books. Massive trigger warnings massive trigger warnings for all kinds of atrocities in that book as well as in these books too. Now as far as The Dragon Republic goes, did I love it as much as I love The Poppy War? No, I will never love anything as much as I love The Poppy War. Absolutely not. Did I give it five out of five stars? I did. Nothing can touch The Poppy War for me. I, it just, it just can't. But I will say that this book does some things that The Poppy War didn't do and expanded on things that were set up in the Poppy War. For example, there is hyper, 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 hyper detailed exploration of colonialism and of white people's manifest destiny, of eugenics. And I loved that. I loved the criticism of colonization. I loved the criticism of the ways in which white people have historically forced their religions onto societies that they deemed were heathens. I was not expecting that in this book and I was so glad that I got it. It was handled extremely well. I thought it was freaking awesome. We see our characters truly grow and expand in this book. They grow and expand in ways that I didn't imagine would happen from the Poppy War. And I really, 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 really loved that. It made them feel real. Oh, there's a lot of betrayal. There's a lot more spiritual magic in this one. I love that this has psycho-spiritual battles in it. That is one of my favorite, favorite things in the entire world in fiction when um, there are spiritual battles. I love, 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 love that. And I will say another thing that this book did that the Poppy War didn't do was it got really into and detailed into military strategy. The person who likes politics in me loved that. I found it so freaking exciting. Thematically, I like this book more than the Poppy War, but nothing will ever touch the Poppy War for me. That book is so personal, so close to home for me. Five out of five stars to them both. While I didn't read half as many books as I wanted to over the months of August and September, the books that I did read, I pretty much loved. That is going to do it for this video. If you managed to stay all the way to the end of this video, I know it was a, it was a lot. Comment down below with the word dragon or with a dragon emoji, just because Dragon Republic was my favorite book out of all of these out of all these books. Thank you for watching another Bowties and Books production. If you liked this video, please give it a big thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I would absolutely love it if you became a part of my bookish family. All my social media links are going to be in the description box below. Stay safe and remember, if Hannibal the Cannibal can wear a mask, then so can you.